Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And this is the Online Great Book Podcast. And, and before we turn the mics on, we were talking about what books we might do in a future show, and we've had a lot of requests for Beowulf, and so we were starting to kind of argue out which Beowulf to read. You were going to make the finest argument for translations that are in rhyming verse. The finest argument. Well, <clears throat> The problem with translation, when you're translating poetry, whatever that language uses for its poetry, you've got to somehow translate into your language, or you just have to ignore it. So uh, I've got the beginning of the Iliad here. I have Fagels, I have the Greek, and I have Alexander Pope. So uh, you're going to have to um, bear with my horrible Greek pronunciation. I'm going to try to do the first two lines in Greek. Main in Aeda Thea Pele Yadeo Achilleos U Lamenen He Muri Echaios Alge Eteke. So it's got this dun ta dun ta ta dun ta ta dun ta ta rhythm with some variations. That's dactylic hexameter. And it does that for twenty four books. Okay, so it's not making you snore. No, it's like a drum. Dum da da dum da da dum. It's like the Darth Vader theme. I see. So it's part of the experience is that this is is rhythmic. I heard a polka. Mm, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> well, I was going a little fast, okay. and I didn't have my lyre, uh, <laughs> which would have accompanied it. All right, so how are you going to translate that? And so Fagel's translate it without any rhythm at all. Rage, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses. Okay, I guess that's what it means, kind of. Uh, Alexander Pope, so it's pretty close on the meaning. But is it close on the poetry? Probably not. <laughs> I think it's probably not. And so here's an alternate view. So um, you can look this up. Alexander Pope has a translation. It's sort of a translation of the Iliad. You can find it on the internet. The wrath of Peleus' son, the direful spring of all the Grecian woes, O goddess, sing. The wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore. Since great Achilles and Atreides strove, such was the sovereign doom and such the will of Jove. That's some sort of iambic, I don't know how many feet. Yeah, I think it's iambic pentameter, and it rhymes, every line rhymes with the previous line. It's like Shakespearean poetry. It's poetry in English, which is not poetry in Greek. And so the question, and this is an open question, if you're ever going to do translation of a poetic work, how much of the poetic field do I want to get, or do I just want to go strictly with the meaning? Yeah, I don't know. The translation isn't the thing, you know? Right. It's, it's just not. Yeah. Uh, you're going to end up leaving something out. Yeah, and so you can choose to be very strict on meaning, but part of the meaning is the presentation. And if it's a rhythmic, poetic presentation, you know, you're going to miss some of that when you're just reading the bare meaning of the text. Me being a, uh, well, there are certainly people more modern than me. I have been told that I'm, a, I'm Amish. But being a sort of a, a more <laughs> modern person than Homer or even Pope, some of that meter stuff kind of takes me out of the thing. It makes it sing songy and makes it weird. Yeah, you're not used to it. Right. Well, they used to do uh, meter, metered speech all the time. And the reason you would do it uh, is because it's memorable. Right. It's an aid to memory. So we are illiterate people who have letters on pages. We don't need the rhymes or the rhythm. For the Greeks, it was rhythm to remember everything. But, you know, I bet you you remember most of this. The Who's down in Whoville loved Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived north of Whoville did not. Hmm. I mean, you remember it because it's got a rhythm. Right. I did not. I do not like it with a goat. I do not like it in a boat. I do not like it here nor there. That's what I say every time I squat. I do not like them anywhere. I remember something from when I was seven years old. One bright day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Yep. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise, came and shot the two dead boys. If you don't believe this lie is true, ask the blind man. He saw it too. I heard that one as well. That's so funny. 
and I have it memorized and I didn't try to memorize it. It's rhythmic and it rhymes. And that's the point of all of that is to get it stuck in your head. We don't really need it because we have paper. Did you ever pull out that little rhyme uh, when you were teaching at university? Yeah, of course. Oh, you did? Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we're going to figure out what we're going to do. We're going to cover Beowulf. It'll be another probably, uh, by the time you hear this, I don't know, it'll be about four weeks after this show's published, you'll hear a Beowulf show, something like that. Maybe we'll do two different versions. Yeah, maybe. If you are not uh, conversant in Old English or in Ancient Greek, which I'm not, I have a little bit of Greek, not much, (laughs) uh, you know, what do you do? I guess you're going to have to look at some different translations and try to get a sense of the original. If you really, like, if you really want to get into Beowulf and you don't have the time to puzzle through Old English, then you maybe read Seamus Haney's, maybe you read Tolkien's, maybe you find another one that you read. It's not terribly long. You know, read all of them. I read uh, Canterbury Tales earlier this year and I found a side by side, like a lobe. You know, it wasn't a lobe, but so it was the uh, middle English on the left page and it was a translation on the right page. And I found that very useful. That being middle English, you can kind of, you can parse through that. And if you've got your Oxford English Dictionary, like all online great books members have, you can work your way through that thing. Mm -hmm. It's slow, but it's, it's useful. It's a useful thing to do, I think. The odd words in, from Chaucer, the the odd words, after about 20 pages, you're going to have looked up all the common ones. Yeah. And you'll get a lot faster. It's so much fun. We're going to get on Beowulf. We'll figure that one out. And uh, we're going to hit Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, we've got Walden coming up at some point soon. Marshall McLuhan's book on media that's going to come up. That'll be a nice companion to our propaganda show. And uh, today, though, Herman Melville's short story from 1853, Bartleby, Bartleby the Scrivener. I had never read it. Yeah, I'd read it a million years ago, and uh, I liked it a lot better the second time I read it. I was thinking about Melville as we were getting ready for this, and he's got an interesting life, and if you really want to dig into it, you can. But then I thought, you know, I don't really want to dig into his life. Right. We have this thought that you have to know everything about an author. You have to find the expert to tell you. You can't just go read Melville. You can't go read Hemingway. You've got to find the scholar. Well, nuts to that. You know, I'm just a fan. I've read a few of his things. I like them. Moby Dick is way up there for me yeah. in my favorites list. Way yeah. up there. The only thing that I, I remembered from looking him up today, he was 32 when he wrote that. Well, you know, that's when people start their uh, life change, 32. Well, he'd already been around the world on sailing ships mm. and uh, wrote a fantastic book at 32 when I I wasn't doing much when I was 32. I cracked into Bartleby. Uh, he, re- he wrote this uh, for Putnam's Magazine, and it was one of these serialized things. You know, we, that we keep we keep reading these uh, serialized for-profit <laughs> pieces of fiction. We need to read a little uh, Dorothy Sayer, too, Carl, when you put that on the list. Yeah. And uh, this is one of those pieces, and he published this anonymously, I saw. And when I started reading this, I thought, golly, this feels like Poe. Well, there was that little bit about uh, Bartleby being walled into the office. Yeah. Which reminded me, was that Cask of Amontillado? The Telltale Heart. Yeah, well, the, one of them, the guy gets walled up inside the... The Black Cat? I don't remember the Black Cat. I don't know. Maybe there's more than one that's walled, walled up. I read this, and I don't know what this story is. Is it a... <laughs> I, well, I don't know what it is. Uh, do we lay out the beats here? Do we lay out the beats and then go into it? What do we do with this damn thing? Sure, sure. So uh, uh, the basic story is the narrator, who is never named, is a lawyer who is a small man. He doesn't want to do anything. He wants everything to be quiet. He wants to do his small business. Well, this is me interpreting it. But he wants to have a calm life. Right. And when you say small, you're not talking about his stature. Right. He's not a politician. He's he, he, he mentions, oh, John Jacob Astor mentioned me once. Right. You know, that's like the highlight of his life. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's like he's just an unremarkable, successful law lawyer of the clerk type, the one that you go to to get your mortgage figured out. He's got he wants his life quiet. He has two people who work for him, uh, Turkey and what's the other guy? Nutter. Well, there's Ginger Nut, and then there's Turkey, and then there's the third guy. Who is it? 
And he's got him set up so, like, Turkey is always upset in the afternoon. Nipper. Nippers is always mad in the morning. And Ginger Nuts, just the kid who goes get the Ginger Nuts. And so he always, he'll he'll call the calm guy in, depending on what time <laughs> of day it is, you know? And uh, he just wants a calm life. Well, uh, he gets a small magistrate's job and business goes up. Well, these people are scriveners. So what a scrivener is... A scrivener is a person whose business is handwriting. He is, they are copyists is another term he uses in here. Yeah. So all of your legal documents, if you ever go back and look into your ancestry and look up legal documents, they're all handwritten. And they have to be handwritten legibly and correctly. So these are human Xerox machines. I was really interested in the little window into their business processes, being the nerd that I am, like mm -hmm. how they actually do their work. He talks about what it's like in a law office that does contract law in 1853 in New York City. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'd have to bring out the, the text, and you would sit and read from the original while the other person read from the copy, and you made sure you didn't get anything wrong. A tedious process of, of reading and checking. Well, he needs a new scrivener, and he gets a man named Bartleby to show up who applies for the job. And he knows nothing about Bartleby. Nope. We get very little about Bartleby. And Bartleby's an excellent scrivener. He's very, very good. He has a neat, fastidious hand, and he's uh, quick. He's quick with his work. And he causes no commotion early on. <laughs> he just does his job. He puts his head down and he does his job. He's just what you want. Yeah, and he's got this little office. The boss likes him so much that he puts him in the corner of his main office behind a screen so that he doesn't need to talk to him or doesn't need to see him, which shows you something about the narrator. He's not really interested in human interaction. And he just wants Bartleby to, Bartleby, come here. And he wants him to appear and then vanish and appear and vanish. And uh, Bartleby has this window a small window that looks out. You have to imagine New York City in 1853. Lots of tall buildings going up right next to each other without adequate alleys in between them. So you have a window that looks out like three feet to another wall. And <laughs> light comes down from far above. It's like the bottom of a cistern, the bottom of a well, I think he describes it. And that's all that Bartleby has. In the, the office there... Best I could tell, it's about a block from Trinity Episcopal Church, Wall Street. It's on Wall Street. So mm -hmm. this is this is New York City, and it's kind of the New York City we know. In the first two or three pages of this story, he talks about himself, the, the uh, narrator. And we never get the narrator's name. But he says, imprimis. This is super important, I thought. I'm a man who, from his youth upwards has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. <laughs> yeah. He's not into doing uh, the harder thing. Um, he, he likes it smooth. Emmett Penny would say smooth hell. <laughs> yeah, he, he likes it smooth and he likes it easy, and that's what's best in life for him. He is no Conan. And then the ne next paragraph he says, where after he says that the John Jacob Astor had mentioned him, he said that his first grand point is prudence, my next method. So he likes prudence and method. Mm -hmm. These are his values. He's laying out his values. And then we see Bartleby deuce on all of that. I'm kind of sad looking at this guy. Uh, the easiest way of life is the best. Um, he describes like he has a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. It's a little bit earlier. We're using a digitized version of the first edition, which yeah. is kind of neat. You can find it on the internet. The first edition is in a, a collection of short stories called the Piazza Tales, P-I-A-Z-Z-A. -Z -Z -A. Go get that. And this all seems to me, well small so we were listening uh so this is a story we were listening to some mongolian heavy metal music in the gym yesterday hmm. uh there's a band called the who capital h u okay <laughs> and uh and they come out and they're dressed like genghis khan and and have some traditional instruments and they do mongolian throat singing and it's thrilling and it's cool and so all the guys in the gym were like 
We're looking around. We're trying to find a, a country that we can go pillage. Right. I've got a list. <laughs> yeah, we were going to go down to Wicker Park and, and see what we could do there. We wouldn't be opposed very much. And it was appealing to something in us, that human urge, mostly a masculine urge, to go and make a mark for yourself. Mm -hmm. This guy doesn't have any of that. This guy is in contrast to the Emersonian character in Self-Reliance and in the American Scholar story. Mm -hmm. He is a an American consumer producer guy. Yeah. He doesn't want anything higher. He wants a, a solid practice. He wants a little bit of esteem from his law practice. That's it. It's not a creative endeavor for him. He doesn't yeah. talk about how he loves the world of letters and law. He doesn't talk about you know how he sees justice done for his clients. There's nothing about that stuff. And he has no hobbies. No. He has no home. I mean, Bartleby ends up living in the office, but the narrator might as well because we never see him outside except when he, one day he tries to go to church and then he doesn't make it. Yeah, they talk about the hours that they keep here. They start you know, early in the morning and they eat at their desks, ginger nuts, typically, mm -hmm. or little cookies. And then um, they work till 6, 7 o'clock at night every day. Like yeah. Six days a week, seven days a week. And so I look at the the employees and I think, and I'm kind of sad for them. So neither of them look happy. So Turkey comes in and he, he's called Turkey, I think, because he gets more and more red faced as the day goes on. I think I, I see him having like a waddle, you know, a big uh -huh. bright red waddle and he gets all inflamed. Yeah. Get the colorful yeah. florid face like a Tom Turkey. And if you catch him in the afternoon, he's the kind of guy that you say hello to him and he says, what? It's because <laughs> his blood sugar's low. He's only eating those stupid... <laughs> And Nippers comes in, Nippers is the opposite. He comes in mad, and then he calms down as the day goes on. Like, Turkey, I guess we get some of his details. Uh, he likes his beer. He likes to drink when he gets out. Nippers has some side gigs going on. Uh, he's doing some stuff down at the at the jail. But they're constrained with the narrator. To be a scrivener is to sit over a desk. Like Nippers, I believe, is the guy that can't get his desk set up right. Yeah, he's like moving his desk around all the time. There was a there was a math teacher at Catoosa High School named Mr. Blankenship. He's long dead. And he moved his desk every day. Just like mm -hmm. an inch here, an inch there. He'd just move it around. And it was just a tick. And uh, my cousin super glued it to the floor. And it was those um, those 12 by 12 inch weird composite tiles that aren't plastic and they're not ceramic. You know the stuff at your school. And Mr. Blankenship went to move his desk and it wouldn't move. And he heaved up on the desk and he just pulled two of the tiles off the floor. He just couldn't not move the desk. And so that's what I thought. Of. And then my cousin Bobby got expelled. <laughs> expelled from Katusa. Yeah, that was not the first straw. I think Nipper's continually working on his desk. So this is uh, page 39. Though of a very ingenious mechanical turn, Nippers could never get this table to suit him. He put chips under it, blocks of various sorts, bits of pasteboard, and at last went so far as to attempt an exquisite adjustment by final pieces of folding blotting paper. So he's going like by the millimeter, <laughs> the half millimeter, and he can't get the thing to work. And the next page, in short, the truth of the matter was Nippers knew not what he wanted. Or if he wanted anything, it was to be rid of a scrivener's table altogether. Yep. That just sets up Bartleby so perfectly because Bartleby sits at his desk and sometimes he just stands and looks at that window at that brick wall. He doesn't move the desk. He doesn't move the screen. He doesn't move himself. He doesn't open the window. He's completely self-contained. Mm -hmm. I think Nippers wants to be out on the step with the Mongols, but he can't. I want him out there. Yeah, he would be great. Instead, he's stuck in an office. He's in a cubicle. Oh, my God. So this story rings truer to me now than it did when I read it as a 16-year-old high school student. Yeah. And didn't know anything about this stuff. But, you know, if you look, that's your life. I'm going to sit and copy other men's words for the rest of my life. You know, uh, you've talked about the guy in the on the assembly line who's going to turn this nut on this particular model of Model T for his entire life. That's something, you know. I mean, it, it, it helps productivity, but... Nippers, I think, might just burn the whole town down one yeah. of these days. So Nippers is the anti-Bartleby. -Bar but so is mm -hmm. Turkey. 
Yeah, the turkey's just in the in the afternoon. Nippers calms down by the afternoon. Yeah, turkey's a slob, he says. He has his pantaloons are loose and baggy. His coats were execrable. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and he said one day I presented Turkey with a highly respectable looking coat of my own, a padded gray coat of a most comfortable warmth, and which buttoned straight up from the knee to the neck. And I thought Turkey would appreciate the favor and abate his rashness and obstreperousness in the afternoons. But he says, butting himself in so downy and blanket-like a coat had a pernicious effect on him. And I love this line. In fact, precisely as a rash restive horse is said to feel his oats, so Turkey felt his coat. <laughs> <laughs> but th- th- these are just like nipper, nippers and Turkey both just are just like boiling over with restiveness and energy and it's the clothes bother them. They, ch- they, they're just chafing all over the place, but they're going to take it. Yeah. They don't ever head for the Hills. Now we have Bartleby. So Bartleby comes in and he does his job very, very well. He's described. How's Bartleby described? It's cadaverous, quiet. Let's see. This is page 45. When the narrator has to advertise for a new person, in answer to my advertisement, a motionless young man one morning stood upon my office threshold, the door being open for it was summer. I can see that figure now, pallidly neat, pitiably respectable, incurably forlorn. It was Bartleby. Incurably forlorn. Yeah, so he checked him out and uh, found his qualifications to be okay, and he hired him. He hired him. And mm-hmm. um, immediately put him to work, and he found out that he was uh, that he wrote silently, palely, mechanically, which is really what he wanted. Mm-hmm. And what do you need? You don't need bullshit out of these guys. Just copy the stuff down, and let's get it done, right? That's what he wanted. You know what I was thinking as I was reading this? What I was wondering what Tiger Mike would have done with Bartleby. Oh, he, oh, oh! Listen, <laughs> we're gonna get <laughs> we're gonna get to that. <laughs> You know what? I was thinking about these guys copying. We're going to get to what Tiger Mike and what Hambrick's theory of management might do with the guy. I was reading about all this copying that they do. It kind of felt like the podcast stuff that we do is a little bit like the copying that they do. How so? I'm going to derail the whole show. Go for it. I'll bring it back. I think that we are living in a post-literate society, which isn't to say that people can't read and they don't know their letters, uh, but they're not really that interested in the reading uh, they are very interested in good conversation. They are still interested in ideas. You know, people aren't dumb or they aren't dumber. Uh, you know, the medium is the message. The medium media has changed. These guys are in there copying, copying, copying. And they're not changing anything that they're doing. But what we do is just so derivative. It, <laughs> like you and I are doing here, I find it really useful. But we're riffing on these other people's work. The work is primary. We're we're secondary, mm-hmm. and the work there is primary. The, the the text in front of them is primary, and they are secondary. I don't know. I I just I felt akin. I felt akin to the script. <laughs> Do you feel like a lonely drudge sitting at a table? I hope I, not. No, I don't. I think our experience is a little bit different. I, I can. It's certainly different. But see the point. You know, I, I'm looking. I'm thinking about Herman Melville. Dear listeners, you can look him up and see the details of his life, and it's pretty amazing. I mean, he wrote this when he's 34. He wrote Moby Dick when he was 32. He is doing something. You know, he's creating content, which is a word we use today. No, he's writing finished works of art. Right. Which is very, very neat. And that is something that we generally don't do. Most of us don't do that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I'm not doing enough of that, uh, although there is something. We are creating something here. And then I've recorded audio versions of some books that there are no audio versions of. I will be putting those out sometime soon. I mean, that is definitely copyist stuff. We're not, I'm not writing it out in longhand, but I'm, taking, I'm making an audible copy of that thing which was already written. If you're doing voiceover stuff, if you're reading audiobooks for recording for other people to consume, I mean, it's copyist work. Yeah. And, and that's happening all over the place. We're kind of post-literate in that way. It's weird. I'm not sure that running the podcast is is a whole lot like being a scrivener, but there are plenty of jobs that are. Well, when I read something for audio production and release as an audiobook, it's definitely like a scrivener. 
Yeah, or when the when the guy makes my Big Mac at the McDonald's. It is not a unique culinary production. He's following a recipe. He's a human yeah. being following a recipe. It is something, just like Scrivening got replaced by mimeographs and then the copy machine, you know, all of those jobs could re be replaced. They don't require any creative human activity. And I suppose it's good that people have a job, but, you know, look at Nippers and Turkey and eventually Bartleby. This story makes me laugh out loud, but it also makes me very sad uh, for people whose lives get necessarily compressed into this tight little focus. This is what I said earlier, that it's like a Poe story. This may be a horror story. Should we get into the horror? Yeah, we've hired Bartleby. We've given him his first contract or document to copy, and he copied it palely and mechanically and did a good job. And the boss man, he never gives his name again, he calls everybody into the, the main room, and there are four copies of this 500-page document, and he wants to distribute them to Ginger Nut Nippers. Bartleby in Turkey, and then he's. I picture him sitting at a podium and reading from the original with the uh, with all the men following along in the copies, looking mm -hmm. for errors and to correct those things. And so he says yeah. uh, he distributes the papers, and he says uh, Bartleby, come in here. It's uh, it's time to review this document that he wrote that he copied, by the way. And Bartleby says in a singularly mild, firm voice, "I would prefer not to." Right. I would prefer not to. I want to go back one page on that because the, the narrator has a nice line. Um, he's talking about how this is a, a bad job. And he says, for example, I cannot credit that the meddlesome poet Byron would have contentedly sat down with Bartleby to examine a law document of, say, 500 pages, closely written in a crippy hand. This is what you're doing. So a real man like Byron. <laughs> I, I, I circled this and I knew that you were going to bring it up. <laughs> well, and I looked up meddlesome in the OED. It's not meddlesome. It's not somebody who meddles in things. It's somebody who has a lot of metal. Yep. M-E-T-T. -T. So that's your value added for OGB. You get the, the Oxford English Dictionary. What sort of a person do you have to be to contentedly just sit down and read, f double check 500 pages of handwriting? Jeez. And so I'm with Bartleby. Bartleby says, I prefer not to. And you know what I wrote? You don't know. I'm going to tell you what I wrote in my notes here. Bartleby, in a, fir in a singularly mild, firm voice, replied, I would prefer not to. And I wrote, like Achilles. <laughs> I wrote I wrote next to it, glorious. <laughs> this is a shot across the bow. This is a crossing the Rubicon. I will not. He doesn't say I will not, though, because that would invite conflict. And this mm -hmm. is the brilliance of Bartleby. Is that the narrator doesn't want any conflict at all. He isn't Tiger Mike. No. He doesn't want any conflict. He wants a quiet office. I mean, he, he calls his scriveners in depending on which one's mild at that time of the day. And he's got it all mapped out. He might have a chart. <laughs> and uh, Bartleby, what are you going to do if an employee says, I prefer not to? Well, we got a little inside joke going on here. There was a guy in Houston, Texas, uh, in the 1970s named Tiger Mike Davis and he owned Tiger Oil Company. And you can go to my stupid little website, scotthambrick.com and see all my crazy ravings. But I have all of the memos that I have collected that he had circulated to his employees at Tiger Oil Company. And he is hard as nails. <laughs> my dad would say he is hard as hell's axle. And he is. He would not stand for this. Now, the attorney says, prefer not to. What do you mean? Are you moonstruck? I want you to help me compare the sheet here. Take it. I thrust it towards him. I would prefer not to, said he. Not a wrinkle of agitation rippled him. Had there been the least uneasiness, anger, impatience, or impertinence in his manner, in other words, had there been anything ordinarily human about him, doubtless I should have been violently dismissed him from the premises. So he's just cool as a cucumber. He likes it smooth. He doesn't like that conflict. Uh huh. He pushes his button. Bartleby is pushing the button that he needs to push, and it's perfect. Well, I was just thinking, so prefer is an expression of the will. Yep. Who else in this story has any expression of the will? No one. They're all just, they're functionaries in, a, in the machine of the legal profession. 
even the lawyer. Yeah. And Bartleby stands athwart them yelling, stop, except he doesn't yell. He just says, I prefer not to. I would prefer not to. It's not, I prefer not to, but I would. It's like when we want people to do things, we don't say, do it. We say, would you please? could you please? Would you please? Well, no, no, I wouldn't. Can you? Can you hand me the pencil? I can, but I don't want to. But I prefer not to. <laughs> he says, I would have as soon thought to turning my pale plaster of Paris best of Cicero out of doors. He, he doesn't know what to do with the guy. So they just do it. They do it without him. So success, Bartleby has succeeded. And then they try it again. And uh, they're going to check copies of some testimony in the High Court of Chancery. And this is the next page. Bartleby, quick, I am waiting. I heard a slow scrape of his chair legs on the uncarpeted floor, and soon he appeared, standing at the entrance of his hermitage. Hermitage is a place where a solitary monk lives. What is wanted, he said mildly. You know, and they, they want him to do the copies. And he says, I would prefer not to, and gently disappeared behind the screen. So Melville is, from the little I know of him, I wrote a high school thesis on Moby Dick, so I've read something about him, but I don't remember it all. But he's got a whole lot of, whole lot of Shakespeare in him and a whole lot of Bible in him. Mm. And it all just pops out here and there. And you can tell, especially in Moby Dick, you can tell um, that he's got all those words in his head. And, and I love it the top of 51, Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. And the narrator, for a few minutes, I was turned into a pillar of salt. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the story. So it's a Lot's wife turning back to look at Sodom and Gomorrah as they're being consumed by the wrath of God. And she gets turned into a pillar of salt. And here's the, the narrator. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> I just love it. It's civil disobedience, you know? Mm -hmm. Nonviolent protest. He says, what is wanted? He doesn't say, what do you want? Well, nobody else has a will except Bartleby. He's got it plenty. He says, it is not seldom the case that when a man is browbeaten in some unprecedented and violently unreasonable way, he begins to stagger in his own plainest faith. He begins, as it were, vaguely to surmise that, wonderful as it may be, all the justice and all the reason is on the other side. Accordingly, if any disinterested persons are present, he turns to them for some reinforcement for his own faltering mind. And he says, Turkey, what, what do you think of this? Am I not right? It's such a good depiction of human behavior. <laughs> did you just see what the guy did? did you, I mean, that's what you would always, that's what you would do, right? What, do, right. what am I supposed to do about this? <laughs> but he had, before that though, he had turned him into a pillar of salt <laughs> He was just speechless. And when I when I read that pillar of salt thing, I have a vision of what the offices look like in my in my mind. And I'm pretty sure he had to look over his shoulder when Bartleby slid the chair back and said, What is wanted? Mm-hmm. Like I actually saw him that looking over his shoulder, and then he says he turned him into a pillar of salt. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. And he's just <laughs> speechless. And then he has to ask Turkey, who's a dick <laughs> and not to be relied on anyway. What up? What? So good. Well, except it is morning time, so Turkey is calm and nipper. Right. So Turkey says, with submission, sir, I think that you are right. And he says to Nippers, what do you think of it? I think I should <laughs> kick him out of the office Yeah, because it's, it's his bad mood time. They have the kid there, Ginger Nut, the kid who runs out to get them the cookies. Uh, he says, I think he's a little loony. He's amused by it. And so... Uh, this is page 53, right in the middle. You hear what they say, said I, turning towards the screen. Come forth and do your duty. So I have written there, like, it's the testimony of society. Look, I've got three people, three of your, the four of us here, we all agree that you should come out and do your work. And he doesn't even answer. I love that. He's a hero. He's Achilles. Yeah, but why does he not want to do it? Does he need a reason? Well, he signed up. He took the job. Well... Up to this point, he's doing his ordinary job. So he's still doing the regular scrivening. That's going to end after a while. So he works himself so hard that his eyes go bad. Because he'll work morning and night by candlelight. And eventually his eyes are not good anymore. And so he decides he's not going to do any more work. And now he won't do anything. And he just says, I prefer not to. I prefer not to. And he just eats these little ginger nut. They're little cookies. 
that are eight for a penny and uh, sits in the corner. And now he won't copy. He just looks at the wall and eats those cookies for lunch. Just, what is it? You know, when I was reading this, I'm like, I hadn't, I hadn't read it before. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if he's going to like sprout horns and kill everybody. If he's going to hang himself, if he's going to, you know, have an in- insurrection and a coup, man, I just don't know. Well, there's a couple of things going on here. There's probably more, but there's a couple of things that strike me. There's the comedy of Bartleby refusing to do stuff. And I think it's funny and I laugh. I'm, I'm laughing now looking at it. Um, <laughs> It's like uh, page 59, he wants Bartleby to go and tell Nippers to come in and do some work. I prefer not to. And the narrator says, Very good, Bartleby, said I in a quiet, sort of serenely severe, self-possessed tone. Um, He just gives in. And the next paragraph, Shall I acknowledge it? The conclusion of this whole business was that it soon became a fixed fact of my chambers that a pale young scrivener by the name of Bartleby had a desk there that he copied for me at the usual rate, but he was permanently exempt from examining any work done by him. This is a little bit before he Mm. quits doing any work at all. And that's just it. This is the established way. So I think that's funny. I mean, this, this is very similar for me to a movie called office space. Uh I don't know if you've seen it where the main character just quits going to work because he doesn't want to. And they end up promoting him. It goes a little further than Bartleby. So off, you could read Bartleby and then watch Office Space. It's the one where the, the girl gets in trouble working for the rest of them because she's not wearing enough pieces of flair on her uniform. Yeah. Which is real similar, you know. <laughs> I I think the, the movie is probably inspired by this. So there's that. But then there is the tragic dimension. Why won't Bartleby do any work? And he does less and less. It turns out he's actually living in the place. The boss comes back on a Sunday and finds that there's a key in the lock and he can't get in. And Bartleby says that he's preferred not admitting me at present. So Bartleby's not dressed or something. He's living in the office. And he has the the lead in his ass to tell the boss to wait in the hall, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> like he's so, so ballsy that he just tells the guy that he's not going to let him in until he's done. Well, why can't the boss do anything about it? Well, he can. But he won't. So what is there in his character? (sighs) He wants his office calm. He wants to have no trouble at all. He wants the easiest life possible. Well, having the easiest life possible breaks on the, the shore of somebody's will. Yeah, this is the problem. This isn't the easiest life possible. You know, dragging that guy out of there by his ear sure does cause a lot of commotion that afternoon that you that you throw him out, but then we can get back to having our life. Uh, not having the moral courage to do whatever needs to be done doesn't lead to smooth sailing, you know? But then he'd have to make a scene. Right. I get it. <laughs> I mean, this is how we do things, and I think my family's a typical German-Irish family. If there's an elephant in the room, you just ignore it. Right. Until it goes away. Because you don't want to call attention to it and make a scene. Did you say German Irish? Yeah. Do Irish people do that? I don't know. Mine did. I think they'll throw down. Not my grandmother. She was always a lady Hmm. sitting there with her, uh, or I thought it was orange juice. My dad might be listening to this. So he, (laughs) (laughs) we thought she was drinking orange juice, but then when they finally passed away, we saw like a, a, a stack of Jim Beam about six feet high in the back closet. So. She might have had something else in there. Good for her. Eventually, they, they don't ever fire him. They move. <laughs> well, he can't get him to leave. He goes up there on a weekend. He finds out the guy's uh, squatting there, essentially. Uh, he asks him to leave. He pay, He offers to essentially pay him to leave. I'll give you a letter of reference, Bartleby. Anything I can do to help you, get out of here. And the guy won't leave. And him and the attorney being such the panty waste that he is, uh, contracts for some space down the street, hires movers, and moves out of his old offices. <laughs> he's, but he's sad about it. There's something about Bartleby's solitude, just looking at the wall, living in the place, having nothing. This is a line on on 66. 
Ah, happiness courts the light, so we deem the world is gay, but misery hides aloof, so we deem that misery there is none. Well, misery is Bartleby. For some reason, he won't go anywhere. He won't do anything. There's something in him that I guess tugs at, at the heartstrings of the narrator. And he doesn't want to do anything mean, but he's got to... <sighs> I don't know. I think that's funny, though. Rather than fire an employee, you just move. Yeah, I do, too. <laughs> I do, too. And then the landlord says, comes to the new offices, you left something. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that they had left was uh, Bartleby. Yeah. Bartleby's still there at the old digs. So weird. The landlord, he, he ain't putting up with it. So they he calls the cops. And they come and get Bartleby, and they lock him up. I bet there's still a prison there. Wherever that was, you know, they're talking about 1853 New York. I bet there's still a prison there. The tombs. Uh, and, and they lock the guy up. I thought, well, this is going to be good for Bartleby. Three hots on a cot. He doesn't want to do anything anyway. He prefers not to. He's going to go out in the yard at the prison there every day and stare up in the sky, which is what he says he does. When I first read that, I thought, this is going to be good for him. But it's not. Nope. Because the I prefer not to thing isn't really about scrivening. It's about life. Bartleby is not interested in life. Right. He eventually prefers not to eat. On 72, I don't know that I like it, uh, but I marked it. This is before the old boss moves out. He's trying to get Bartleby to comply in something, to do some kind of work. In short, say now that in a day or two you will begin to be a little reasonable. Say so, Bartleby. And he says, at present I would prefer not to be a little reasonable. And then it goes on. Was his mildly cadaverous reply. Cadaverous is a marvelous adjective. He's becoming a cadaver. He doesn't really want to live. Yeah. He just wants to fade away. He prefers not to live. And you know what? Well, there's... there's a few things going on. Why is he so sad? We're going to get to that in the end. From what I've read of Melville, there'll be the funny stuff. There's a whole lot of funny stuff. Moby Dick is funny. Yeah. But then there's this voice of doom stuff going on underneath it. There's like this head on crash with mortality underneath the story. So it's like you're swimming on the top of the lake and you don't know that the lake's two miles deep. Yeah, there are monsters under there. Yeah. What's the deepest water you've ever swum in? Lake Superior. But were you actually in the deep part? No. No. Does it freak you out when you swim on a, a really deep A little bit. Lake? Yeah. There's just water down there. If I sank, I would just keep going. Yeah. Let's see. There's a little lake in southeast Oklahoma, Lake Arbuckle. And I was in a boat, and I jumped out of the boat and swam and got back in the boat. And then I looked at the uh, depth finder. And this sucker is deep, man. 150, 160 feet deep. For mm -hmm. a freshwater lake in the middle of Oklahoma, that's pretty deep. And uh, I thought, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to jump out of this boat and, and do that again. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's uncanny Yeah, to do it. Well, okay. So Bartleby doesn't want to do anything, except he doesn't want to be compelled either. So putting him in jail is not good for him. No. Because you're restricting his freedom to do nothing at all. When they first put him in jail, do you think, well, this is the second time you read it. And the first time you read it was in the 1950s, I think. <laughs> um, did you think like I did? I thought this will be good for him. Yeah. You did? Yeah. You know, you think um, the only problem with jail is is you have to beat up the toughest guy the first day you get there. After that, it's three meals a day. All right. A library, a bed. What else do you need? You know, it seems almost freeing and simpler. He doesn't want to go anywhere, but the fact that he wouldn't be able to go anywhere, it takes all of the preferring out. Mm -hmm. So rather than preferring not to do anything, he can't do anything, which is yeah. a different uh, a different thing. And so they, they get him into the jail. He has one sharp word that he gives. The bottom of 78, and I, I drew a little picture of this in my book. I draw pictures. We, we need we need a picture of that picture for the show notes. <laughs> it's not that good. So the, the narrator says, uh, goodbye, Bartleby. 
and fare you well. But he answered not a word. Like the last column of some ruined temple, he remained standing mute and solitary in the middle of the otherwise deserted room. And I just drew a picture of like half of a Greek column yeah, standing in a plane. It's eerie. Such a good image. And, and right there by that, I wrote, is Bartleby a sociopath? Probably. Yeah. Is his brain broken? Yeah. So we don't ever get an explanation from Bartleby why he prefers not to do anything. He's not going to tell you that. He's just going to continue not doing anything. <laughs> He's just going to keep on not. Yeah, this is not a satisfying story because um, uh, Melville, as an artist, had the gonads to not put a bow on it for us and just leave it there. <laughs> I think a lesser writer, a less, less experienced writer, would want to sum this up for the reader, and he doesn't. He doesn't do that. Well, a modern writer, you would have to do the backstory, right? We always right. have backstories. If you, dear listener, are one of those millions of people that watches all of the superhero movies origin stories they're all origin stories we've got to explain everything behind you know why uh thanos does things i was especially frustrated i'm one of those millions too i watch them i was very frustrated with the all of the the sympathetic backstory for thanos you couldn't just let him be evil mm -hmm. you had to make him a frustrated environmentalist you know you can just leave things bare and sparse like that column in the middle of nowhere and the reader will put the meaning in. Your mind will spin all around this thing, trying to figure out, well, why won't he do it? And we have a hint at the end. Bartleby dies. Okay, spoiler. There's so much good prose I'm skipping here. But he ends up not eating in the jail. And this is after, by the way, the attorney has offered to take him home and place him in his home. Mm-hmm. Which was a dumb move, by the way. Yeah, I don't think you would do that. And he ends up, well, he just won't eat. He actually hires a guy to feed him. One of the guys that hangs around the jail and brings special food to the people in the in the jail. Apparently, you could do that. You could, If you had money, you could get better food than typical. The grub man would bring better food to your friends. They take him his dinner. So this is page 105. Uh, strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up and lying on his side, his head touching the cold stones, I saw the wasted Bartleby, but nothing stirred. The grub man comes up. His dinner is ready. Won't he, won't he dine today either? Does he live without dining? Lives without dining, said I, and closed the eyes. He's asleep, ain't he? With kings and counselors, murmured I. So he has finally died. He preferred not to live, and he died. Why did he do it? Does he need a reason? We get a little tiny bit of a reason. And this is that the depths under the lake that can freak you out. So Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead letter office at Washington. He lost his job when there was a change in administrations. Dead letters. So what a dead letter is, you send a letter and perhaps the recipient dies. Can't be delivered. Yep. Undeliverable mail for whatever reason. Sometimes they're dead. Sometimes you get the address wrong. Melville describes it. The narrator describes it on 107... Uh, for by the cartload they are annually burned, so there's a whole lot of these. Sometimes from out the folded paper the pale clerk takes a ring, the finger it was meant for perhaps molders in the grave, a banknote set in swiftest charity, he whom it would relieve, nor eats nor hungers any more. Pardon for those who died despairing, hope for those who died unhoping, good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life these letters speed to death. And then he ends with, Ah, Bartleby, ah, humanity. So the nearest I can make out as to why Bartleby is the way he is, he's just overcome by... You think the dead letter office broke him? Yeah. There's a bit in Virgil that hits me like this. When Aeneas goes down to the underworld, I guess that's a spoiler. Aeneas goes down to the underworld and he gets to see... Virgil describes all the dead coming to the water to try to get across the water to go in the underworld. And it's it's like you know, a bunch of babies and young unwed girls and, and children. And there's just yeah. millions and millions and millions of them. And if you don't have any, any defense against that, that could be overwhelming. And to have to deal with it with the letters sent to, you know, it's 1853. So you send a letter to your dearest friend 
back in Boston or something, and it turns out he died of a of a flu. Yeah, a week before. And apparently they didn't have returned under at that point. You know, I had I used to own a company called Data Storage, and we stored medical records and all kinds of other records, both digital and hard copy. And in warehouse one on aisle D, we had medical records for a local hospital. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of cubic feet of hard copy paper medical records on the shelf in there. And we stored them in 1.2 cubic foot boxes. And later on, later on, we digitized them. But at one point I was walking down aisle D and I, and uh, I had had a request from the hospital to pull out a medical record for a lady who had, uh, well, actually, I don't know that she had died, but we had a request for, they call it uh, REM, release of information. I went and pulled the box that it was in and uh, got the record out and it wasn't all of it. And then I pulled the next box and it still wasn't all of it. There were like 26 volumes of medical record for this lady. If you'd stacked it up on the floor, it was up to your waist probably. And I looked up that aisle and then back down the aisle. It's like 175 feet long, this aisle. Boxes stacked 26 feet high. They're just all medical records. I was like, oh, all the suffering these things represent. People don't go to the hospital and have a page put in their medical record that says, Carl's feeling good today. <laughs> I'm feeling okay today. I ought to make a record. I never liked, I mean, I, I don't know that I love going down that aisle anyway, but I damn sure didn't like it after that ever again. Uh, aisle D is haunted. It's cataloged and boxed and made check marks on a sheet, you know. Um, yeah. A writer that we read earlier, Gabriel Marcel, his job was to, in World War I, which was formative to him, was to find survivors of the dead and tell them that their son had died in the trenches, poison gas or something, you know? Yeah. And so you're reducing human life to an envelope, to a manila folder. It could be hard. So this is where this story becomes extremely frightening. Yeah. So, so far it's been funny. <laughs> i got to talk more about these medical records. Yeah. You have to retain these medical records for legal reasons and for quality of care reasons for a number of years. And if somebody dies, you can start the clock and then destroy the record, you know, a certain number of years after the death of those, per- those people. But the thing is, you don't always know when they're dead. Like, you know, maybe they, maybe they complete their cancer treatment and then they leave the hospital, but then they die at a different hospital in a different city, and you wouldn't know. But we had records boxed up, and it actually said on the boxes, expired. And they would just refer to the records as expireds. Well, every one of those was a dead person. Every one of those Mm -hmm. file folders was a dead person. And a lot of the people had, you know, like I said about the first lady I mentioned, multiple volumes. And it takes days and days and days in a hospital to rack up all all those volumes, you know. Oh, those are expireds. Ho hum. Yeah, gruesome. So putting this thing on the end of this story, when you've had the whole story be about men confined in a legal office, nobody's going to care when turkey and nippers die. Yeah. Nobody's going to care when the narrator dies. Nobody has families as far as we can tell in the story. And so the the whole thing, the very beginning of the story, talking about um, these, this is a story of the hidden people. I forget exactly how he puts it. I think it's brilliant. Who would have thought to write a story about law clerks? So he says at the beginning, so I want to look at it. Uh, At the very beginning, the nature of my avocations has brought me into more than ordinary contact which with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men. Well, I don't know who it's interesting to, of whom as yet nothing that I know of has ever been written. Nobody's ever written about these people. The law copyists or scriveners, the the little people that, and I don't mean they're little, you know what I mean. They're They're of no account to the world. They don't live big lives. He does the same thing in Moby Dick. He was on these ships. And it's like a way to memorialize all those people that lived and died on those ships. We need to, dear reader, you should read 
Richard Henry Dana's book, Two Years Before the Mast. We should probably read that one, too. I have not read that one. I have it somewhere here. God. You haven't. We've got to read it. Okay. Does it have a lot of the mizzen mast stuff in it? Oh, yeah. He was... Uh, and the details of sails? The common men on the boats, they slept before the mast. Like, the captain was in the at the back of the ship. You know, you've seen in the in those old movies, you know, he's got the windows that look out the aft end of the ship. And so the common people were before the mast. And so this kid, I think he's a Harvard kid, uh, Richard Henry Dana, enlists. He's a common sailor on a ship that goes around the Horn of South America to uh, what is California. It was Mexican-held, you know, uh, Spanish-held California at the time. And he just talks about all the common stuff they do. I think it's a good companion to... Moby Dick, uh, but he writes about just regular people yeah. on that that he sailed with, and it's a memoir. It's so good. It's fiction, all right. It was there really a Bartleby? There were probably a bunch of them. Yep. Now they shoot up the pl- their workplace. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, or it's find hard to do other that muzzle loaders. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> yeah, let me let me reload this. Uh, I got to go to the museum, the military museum in Jefferson City, Missouri. I think we might, if we have time, we might stop there in a week and a half or so. And uh, it turned out the the colonel in charge of it uh, was is from the town just north of me, so we're neighbors. And we were the only people in the museum, and so we we got a special tour. And they have a beautiful musket there, perfect condition. And he says, do you want to hold the musket? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I do. And so he pulls it out, and he hands it to me, and so I got to feel the heft of the thing. But then he starts counting through. I think you had something like the fastest you could be was – 19 seconds, I think. And he's counting this down and saying what you have to do uh, step by step as I'm holding this huge thing, trying to figure out where all the parts are. And meanwhile, while you're doing that, you know, while you're doing that, uh, the British are coming, (laughs) you know, you're getting shot at while you have to calmly stand there and be a scrivener Mm -hmm. and be very, very, you know, just I have to do this step and then this step and then this step. And I can't pay attention to anything else. I can only do this step. Yeah, well, anyway, I, that's the diversion. But I don't know. My feeling on this, my, I think my feeling, even back in high school when I read this, you read it and you, you look at Bartleby and like the narrator, you feel for him. You see why he is the way he is. And perhaps then you feel for yourself. Mm-hmm. When I read this thing, it was a roller coaster ride. Um, I thought at first, I'm like, oh, this is wonderful civil disobedience. It's nonviolent. I prefer not to. I would prefer not to, uh, which is even more passive than I prefer not to. It seemed like he was keeping good boundaries. I'm just here to scriv. <laughs> I'm here to be a scribe. You know, I'm not here to check my work. You can have somebody else do that. I prefer not to. And then it devolves and exposes the dysfunction of the the boss man, whatever he is. And then it becomes another critique of work. We keep doing that. I don't know if I'm just keep projecting myself on it, on this stuff, but, uh, uh, his work at the dead letter office and they kind of kind of broke him. Maybe, Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that explicitly, but, but maybe it did, but that's the last time he actively worked really is when he was there. It's sad. It's a horror story. I mean, it reads like Poe. It's eerie. It's it's worth reading. Uh, but it's funny. <laughs> it is. It is funny. I was thinking of uh, the times I've worked in offices and the the people with their habits, and you get to know them, and it's just like turkey and nippers. I'm remembering. There's Steve. He's going to 905, time to go to the toilet. Right. Now, we had a guy named Al. He'd come in. He'd have his coffee, and it'd be around that time. You knew, don't go in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Because there was going to be a bomb dropped, I'll and he did it. that every day. I'd like to say it's charming, but it is. It, it really wasn't. But it, it's unique. You know, people have these little marks of their character, and uh, right. I, I'd rather they not end up just expired on a shelf. Literature can be a way 
to make them more than an expired on the shelf. Yeah. I really do think of Achilles when I read this. And you read the Iliad, for me, it's always Homer. You go back to the Iliad, and all these people are dying, but they get their few lines of characterization from the poet, a few lines of remembrance. And you only get a very little for Bartleby, and he probably wasn't even real. There might have been a few guys that were him. There's a composite Bartleby, right? Yeah, like uh, George Adler, who wrote a Latin grammar. Uh, I th I've suggested that to you before. He and Bartleby, no, not Bartleby, he and Melville met each other on, a, on an ocean voyage and talked philosophy the whole time, Schopenhauer and things. And, and Adler ended his life in an asylum. And I think Melville was one of, might have been the only person at the funeral. There's Bartleby's all over the place. And so the literary story of Bartleby is kind of a tribute to all those folks and to the turkeys and the nippers and the ginger nuts. Yeah. So gross. What a bummer. <laughs> You're bringing me down, bro. I'm sorry. Are you sorry that you read it? No, it is a wonderfully crafted short story. It's just as tight as it could be. Yeah. There's not a spare word in the thing. Um, it's all perfectly designed to to put forth the personalities of these people without explicitly describing their personalities. Yeah. He doesn't say, Turkey is like this. He gives all these little stories about the coat and about the snacks that they buy and uh, uh, the details in the thing. I, I love – did you see that they were – they moisten their mouths very often with Spitzenbergs? Well, I had to go look that up. <laughs> that was an apple that was grown in upstate New York in the 1700s and 1800s and uh, isn't grown anymore except by weird heirloom fruit enthusiasts. So you didn't send away for a Spitzenberg? I would love one. I would pay up to $15 to eat a fresh Spitzenberg app. I bet you somebody out there has one. I'm sure. It's just a tight little story, and it just sings right along. Let me see, 32 pages, 70 pages. But again, it just sings right along. It's, it's big uh, type. It's not very long. And it's funny and gross. Well, And it's a sort of novel. So this is a an American novelist within 100 years of the founding of the country, and this is the sort of stuff he's writing. You know, so yeah. it, if you're interested in American stuff, you know, figuring out who these people were, who the giants were, what they wrote. Melville was a complete failure as a writer. Nobody read it until he died. Yeah. Uh, but you have people like him. You have Mark Twain. We probably ought to read some Mark Twain eventually. Sure. Do you think this disposition that the that the attorney has and that this problem that these clerks have is distinctly American? We have a little of that in Cratchit, right, in The Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. this kind of crappy work. I think at least for um, – right, I'm going out on a limb here. The strictly commercial kind of person. I don't in know. the 19th century – so in Europe, I think things would be different. There's class structure. Nobody ever expected you to do anything if you're not of the right family. Mm -hmm. So – well, Turkey is expressly from England. I don't know where Nippers is from, but he's, he's – uh, I think he's an unsavory character. I think he's got some side gigs that are... He might nip your wallet Yeah, if you're not looking. Uh, but I think there is... Because there was so much scope in the American experience at the time that a lot of people would feel it more, the constriction of the office. And you might just take off. So in comparison with Bartleby, if you feel restricted to Bartleby, go read the first chapter of Moby Dick where the narrator of that story talks about how he's attracted to the water. And every now and then, he's just got to go get on a ship and get away from everything. I think at least in 19th century America, you could just go west. Mm -hmm. You could just get out of town and go someplace that nobody knew you. And so to sit in an office like this might feel worse than it does if you're, I don't know, working in, in Berlin or something for the Kaiser. You know, you don't have any scope anyway, and you're never going to. Mm -hmm. So it, it might not feel as bad to you. It's like you get a breath. Okay, it's the window. Yeah. It would be better not to have the window. To have that little breath of fresh air and that little bit of light from the window is enough to show you that, you know, this isn't so good. The window does kind of make it harder when you read the description of him looking at this small window at a wall three feet outside the window. 
Oh, jeez. Yeah, he would have been better off underground with no windows. Well, that's what he did. Yeah. Such a good story. It's got all kinds of symbolism. You can read as much into it as you want. Uh, all this fiction stuff is so much harder for me to figure out, discuss. <laughs> well, you're the guy that said it. Melville does not tie it up in a bow for you. That's the thing about good fiction. Yeah. It's supposed to leave you a little bit unsettled. That's on purpose. It's like... Our friend Iris Murdoch. Yeah. One of our online Great Books members posted a link to a video on YouTube of Iris Murdoch talking about writing, the activity of writing. And um, I, I went and watched a little chunk of that. Uh, I highly recommend it. Carl, did you see that link? We mm -hmm. need to dig that up and put it in the show notes. She wrote philosophy and she wrote fiction. And the, the guy interviewing her said, you know, in your mind, what's the difference? Are you conscious of writing in a different way when you write to two different genre? And she says, oh, yes. When I write philosophy, my goal is to clarify. When I write fiction, my goal is to mystify. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought you cow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love her. I love her. And uh, she describes it from the inside looking out, you know, uh, what she's trying to do there um, when she writes those two different kinds of things. And that mystification piece is, I mean, that's what happens. And I don't, I don't like that feeling. But on the other hand, I bet you Bartleby is going to get in your head. Yeah. We are all Bartleby a, a little bit, aren't we? Yeah. We've all had that, that gig. Or we all have that role that we that we play right sucks i want to head out with genghis khan you know where are you going i think wisconsin is pretty much undefended <laughs> yeah the the access to milwaukee is wide open hmm could drive him into the sea the uh marches of wisconsin are unguarded <laughs> yes that's awesome <laughs> yeah what are we going to read next I don't know. You want to read the Articles of Confederation? You want to read Gawain? What do you want to read? We could do Gawain, I guess. We've got to pick a translation quickly. Um, Tolkien. All right. I might have that somewhere. I've got it right here on my clipboard. I'm a peepaw. I take these PDFs and I print them out and I put them on a clipboard and I carry it around with me. <laughs> and I'm too cheap to buy a clipboard, so I just have a board with a an actual board with a clip. He just held that up. It's not a clipboard. It's a <laughs> no, clip it's a... on a board. <laughs> but it doesn't lie flat because the clip will... You need to spend $2 at the Walgreens on a clipboard. No, it's easier to pick up that way. Hmm. Just get my finger right in it. That's perfect. It doesn't snag when you put it in a bag? Uh, I have to carry... Why would I put it in a bag? I need it with me at all times. And here's the thing about the clipboard with the, the clip and the board. You can clip on both sides. But you might need an extra clip on the bottom. That's right. If you're high speed, you'll need two clips. <laughs> That's how I do That's it. That's funny. Do you wear... Uh, Belt and suspenders? Yeah, that was my question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I prefer overalls. I do know that. <laughs> All right. This has been fun. Yeah. Melville, Melville is wonderful. Uh, we'll read for uh, the next show, guys. Go pick up Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, it's not Middle English, is it? It's uh, Old English. It's Old English. It's uh, contemporary with... Um, no, it's Middle English. I'm losing my mind. It's contemporary with uh, Canterbury Tales, Chaucer. Uh, Chaucer's dialect is the sort of London, South, U South England dialect. And Gawain and the Green Knight is uh, by an unknown author... And supposedly, it's the, sort of the Midlands and um, in Northern England dialect, so it's a little bit different. We could also read Piers Plowman, Piers the Plowman, at some point. Gawain and the Green Knight, I think, was lost for a time and uh, was recovered, so it was less influential than, uh, than a lot of things. But, you know, interesting. So it'll be our first King Arthur story. All right. All right. There is another online great books podcast um, a number of you have left some uh, reviews and those are helpful to us thank you for doing that thank if you, you haven't left a review please do maybe use our show as a kicking off point to start your own discussions of these books get some buddies together and uh, uh, send them the pdf of bartleby the scrivener and say hey read this and come over to my house thursday night uh, i'll have good cheese and a little bit of a port or something, and we'll eat that, and we're going to hammer through this thing and figure out how uh, his job is like our jobs and how 
<laughs> well, we hate right. it. Right. And when you do this, you might be at the end of your two hours. It should only be about two hours. You might have that unsettled feeling, but I guarantee yeah. you, you're going to have more fun than you would with passive entertainment. Yeah. That's right. You'll be tingling. Everything will be jumping. You'll be walking around thinking stuff. You'll be at a higher pitch and, of being. And you'll find out that your friends that do this with you have have stuff in them that you didn't know about because you had only been talking about college football before. And if you're interested in learning a little more about what we do, you could uh, text ILP to the phone number 918-992-7446, and I'll send you leaks to stuff you can download and read and learn um, more about how to actually do a sort of great books discussion on your own. And you can go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash OGB podcast and sign up for our waiting list. And when we kick enrollment open, you'll be the first to know and we'll give you a special discount code. So you'll save 25% off your first three months. We don't advertise for anybody else here and we ain't going to, but we got to shill for something to make it pay because uh, we aren't the United Way around here. <laughs> it ain't all charity. <laughs> So go join the, the VIP waiting list and maybe leave a review and start a group on your own. If you start a group on your own, that'll be payment enough for me. Right. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you in one week. Thanks. Thanks.